Oh, Father, we come to your word again this morning. Needy, dependent, eager, hopeful. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, your word would have its way in our hearts. This double-edged sword, living and active, is your word, alive, energetic. May it be so in us. May we not be dull of hearing. May we not be hard of heart. May we be soft and pliable before you. And Lord, would you have your way with us? In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Revelation chapter 10. We'll continue our study of this book. Verse by verse, as we make our way through, we'll be looking this morning at verses 8 through 11. Do you want the good news first or the bad news? <laughs> okay, that wasn't supposed to be responsive. That was a rhetorical question. And it's a trick question because this morning it's all the same. The title of this morning's message is the good news, bad news of the good news. In other words, the, the book you have in your hands, the Bible, God's Word, this two-edged sword cuts both ways, both for good news and for difficult news. What we have in the Bible is God's Word, and those who look to God in humility and faith tremble at His Word. Those who look to God in faith also delight in His Word. We would eat it like the sweet honey from the honeycomb. And there's no book like it. It is the very self-disclosure of God. It is His heart. It is His mind. It is His way of thinking about the world. It is His own self-disclosure about who He is. And it is his accurate assessment of us, our true condition, who we really are underneath. He sees all, he knows all, and he has given us his word. The, the word of God is dangerous. It, it, it does not appease our idols. It does not endorse the things that we love more than God. It, it will unearth them. It will confront them. The Word of God does not come to approve our preconceived ideas. We don't come to God's Word to get a slogan to put over our way of life as it is. We come to God's Word to meet Him, to know Him. We don't come to the Bible to puff up our self-image. In fact, if you come to the Bible, you will be devastated before the Lord. This book comforts, but it also confronts. It consoles and it changes. It encourages and it indicts. This book does all of the above. Turn your attention this morning to our text for study. It is Revelation 10, 8 through 11. The Apostle John records for us these words. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings." Here, the Apostle John is in his vision of the future on the precipice of history. 
He's right at the turn, as we looked at a couple of weeks ago. He's right on the edge of everything changing. Jesus is about to take his earth back. His kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, will come to the earth and Jesus will reign. And on his way to Jerusalem to reign over the world, he will trample his enemies. He will set free his servants and he will usher in a new world of peace and joy and delight, essentially turning the entire globe back to something like the Garden of Eden. And notice in verse 7 of Revelation 10, we had that word, good news. As he preached good news to his slaves, the prophets. The word there is to gospelize, to, to good news proclaim. Normally, we think of the good news as related to the cross and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here the good news refers to the culmination of redemptive history in the risen Christ's return to the earth. The good news proclaimed here in this text is the gospel of consummation, the change of everything, the turning point of human history, the recovery, the restoration, the culmination of God's redemptive plan for the world. It is the gospel of the kingdom. God has good news for the world, and that good news is this, to save sinners and to restore the creation to its intended condition. This is God bringing His earth, bringing to earth His kingdom, that kingdom mediated through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in a reign that will last a thousand years on the earth and then continue into a new heavens and new earth forever. John's vision of the future is right on the edge of that turn, right on the edge of that change. It is the very best news for all of God's servants. But it is not good news for those who rebel, for those who remain in unbelief. And this is the good news, bad news side of the best news ever. And there's no problem with the news itself. The the word itself is good. The, The giver of this message is good. And when this good news falls on the ears of those who do not want it, it comes with eternal consequence. Here on the precipice of the turn of history, John is commanded to internalize the truth, he is personally affected by the truth, and then he is directed to proclaim the truth. That's what this passage is about, and and that functions as our outline this morning. John is commanded to internalize truth, be affected by the truth, and then proclaim the truth. We notice, first of all, in verse 8, that John here is commanded to internalize the truth. Look down at your Bibles. He reports, Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard speaking with me, saying, Go, take the scroll which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. This angel, as we saw last week, is a a great angel standing on the sea and on the land. This strong angel, as he is called, perhaps gargantuan and wide stanced. He has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea. And his announcement is an announcement that will encompass the entire world. I think that's what's depicted by his standing on land and sea. God's coming intervention in the affairs of men will encompass the entire globe and everybody on it. It will not be isolated. It will not be regional. It will not be secret. It will fill the earth. And the scroll in this angel's hand, according to the text, is open. That is, unlike the seven thunders... They uttered some utterance that is secret, we don't know. John heard it and was told to seal it up. This message, this little scroll open, is to be published. It is not secret. It represents the termination of the way things have been and the bringing in of a new order. This scroll is a physical summary of the coming turning point of history, the consummation, the arrival of the kingdom of heaven to earth. So we see here that John complies, he approaches the angel and requests the scroll, just as he was commanded. And then in verse 9, the angel says, take it and eat it. 
take it and eat it. This is a little scroll, and I think the design of the little scroll in John's vision is just so that he can take it and ingest it. This would be a physical demonstration of what John is to do with these words. He's not the first to be given this command. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 2. We'll spend a little time this morning in Ezekiel 2. There are some significant parallels here. Perhaps a backdrop for this scene. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 8, God says, Now as for you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was sent forth to me, and behold, a scroll was in it. Then he spread it out before me, and it was written on the front and the back, and written on it were lamentations, sighing, and woe. And then back up from that passage, one verse, look at verse 7. You shall speak my words to them, whether they listen or whether they refuse, for they are rebellious. Already we see parallels to the passage before us in Revelation chapter 10. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel was commanded to take in God's word in a very physical way in his prophetic ministry. He was to eat it. And then he was to proclaim it. And his faithfulness to taking in and then proclaiming God's word was not contingent on whether it had a successful hearing, whether they listen or not, say these things. So we see in Revelation 10, and you can keep your finger in Ezekiel 2, we'll come back here. But in our text this morning in Revelation 10, we see that John is not only commanded to internalize this word, but he is also personally affected by it. He is personally affected by it. Look at the second half of verse 9. Take and eat it, it will make your stomach bitter but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey, and when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. The command here to John is to take it and eat it, and then this bit of warning ensues. It will turn your stomach sour. It will cause your belly to wrench but it will taste sweet in your mouth. John complied and he recorded exactly as it happened. He switches the order and that makes sense because he would taste the sweetness of it in his mouth first and then it would be bitter in his belly. And this is a physical demonstration of the effects of internalized truth. Ingest the scroll, make it personal. This would be personal and even physiological for John. And you think about what it is to take in God's word. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 16 says, pleasant words are a honeycomb. They are sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And you know the truth of that general statement. When, when somebody says words that are pleasant, you take them in and, and they have a sweetness to them. They are welcome. Proverbs 24, 13 says, My son, eat honey, for it is good. Yes, the honey from the comb is sweet to your taste. And know that wisdom is thus for your soul. If you find it, then there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. There the illustration is reversed. It's, hey, think about honey for a while. Think about how good it tastes. Now what I'm really talking about is wisdom. Ingest that. The psalmist picks up on this theme in talking about the Bible. He says, the law of Yahweh is perfect, Psalm 19.7. It restores the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true, they are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey 
and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. It would be enticing enough for the Bible and Bible intake to be compared to something sweet like honey. There also is the promise of every characteristic of the Word of God applied to those who receive it in faith, culminating in the promise in verse 11, in keeping them there is great reward. But listen to the first half of verse 11 of Psalm 19, by them, by the words of Yahweh, your servant is warned. That's a That's a negative word, that's a darker word, that's a bad news word. It it, it doesn't leave you where you are, It, it tells you there is a path ahead of you which brings about destruction, disaster, and harm. Don't go there. And so the Word of God is not all niceties, it comes with admonitions and warnings, as well as promises and rewards. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. This is the believer's perspective about taking in God's word. And then he says in verse 104, from your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. That's an interesting juxtaposition of ideas. Here's this thing that is sweet as honey, and when I take it in, it makes me hate things. This is the good news, bad news of the good news of God's word. You see, internalizing God's word will produce an aversion to whatever is contrary to God's ways. The psalmist says, hating every false way. You see, there's a bittersweet reality to the truth. The the truth of God's word is not to be observed as information, taken in as entertainment, a sort of book we sit on the sidelines and admire, But the Word of God is to be internalized. It is to be taken in as something sweet and desirable, more desirable than gold to possess, sweeter than honey to the taste. But the Word of God, as we said earlier, is alive and double-edged. It is energetic, it is active, and, and it does things. And a sharp, two-edged, two-bladed weapon that has a mind of its own and is energetic is a dangerous thing. It it meddles. It, It does surgical work on the inside, places you didn't think anything could go. The Word of God goes there and troubles us. And there's nothing wrong with the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with the message. There is everything right with the truth. But there is something very terribly wrong with us. Not at the surface level, not at the outside. The deeds that we do that people can see and and we wish we were better than we are, those are symptoms of the deeper reality of the corruption within God sees it and He knows it, and and there's something very terribly wrong with us in our programming. By nature, we are enemies of the truth. That's how we were born, every one of us. And those humans left to their own nature, the natural man, as Paul calls it in 1 Corinthians 2.14, They do not understand the things of the Word of God because those things are spiritually gotten and the natural man is unable to get them in his own nature. This is why for a believer, trembling under God's Word, delighting in God's Word, we can only say, how is it that I I love God's Word this way, that I, I want it to do these things in me? That is a product of the work of God's Holy Spirit who authored this word, and when the word of God enters someone accompanied by the Holy Spirit of God, 
that word of God resonates internally. That is something an unbeliever does not have. That is why there is something of a, a veil of a spiritual resonance over the eyes of those who haven't belonged to God. This all changes, of course, when we come to grips with Jesus Christ, the Word of God incarnate, who came to the earth and went to the cross to pay for our sins to bring us to God. And when you surrender your life to Jesus, He's in charge, and He paid for my sins, and I belong to Him, something has happened. The very nature of who you are on the inside has been changed by grace, has been changed by the power of God, has been changed by the Holy Spirit of God who speaks through His Word. And now it's something like having a, a radio that can tune into the frequency. God speaks, and we hear, and we love, and we respond. Even at that sight of the best news of the cross work of Christ, there is a bitter sweetness. I don't know if you've contemplated this. We, we think about the cross as good news. It, it certainly is that. It, it is simultaneously the worst thing that's ever happened. It was the murder of God, deicide. It was the most awful event in human history. It was the most wicked crime perpetrated by humanity against the one most deserving of praise, adoration, love. And we treated him like a common criminal and soldiers spit in his face. And a crowd cried out for his execution. All of this, of course, was his plan so that he would go to the cross and take upon himself the sins of everyone who would ever believe. When you pray for somebody to become a Christian, and, and I hope you do, I trust you do, I, I, I trust that as a, a regular impulse of your heart to look around at a sea of humanity and recognize that people are separated from God and, and their only hope is to turn to Christ. I hope you pray for them. There is a sense in those evangelistic prayers that we are asking God to transfer the sins of those rebels onto the account of His beloved Son. And for that Son to have endured all of their crimes and God's wrath against them in its fullness so that they could go free and be forgiven and live. It's something of an audacious prayer when you think of it this way. God, would, would, would you take all of their filth and place it on your perfect, holy beautiful son and crush him in their place. That is what we're praying. And, and of course, God wants us to pray this way. It is the way he saves sinners. He is not eager that any die and remain in their sins. God wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. And that ought to be our heartbeat too. And so when we pray this way, we we pray along God's heart, but we are asking that the Messiah would endure the bitterest blackness and the awful news that he would bear their sin at the cross. This was, in fact, the news or the contemplation of this reality were the darkest, bitterest thoughts Jesus had. In the garden, he prayed to his father, can this cup, the, the cup of the wrath of God poured out against the Son for the sins of others, can this cup be taken away? If there, is there any other way? Of course, he also prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Out of obedience to the Father and love for sinners, he went to the cross and did that very thing. 
this bitter and sweet experience of eternalize, internalizing the Word of God that John experienced was the, the same experience Ezekiel had. Back to Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 10. That scroll was handed to him. He spread it out before me, Ezekiel says. It was written on the front and back. And, and written on it, this scroll that Ezekiel was to ingest were lamentations and sighing and woe. It doesn't taste good. In Ezekiel 3, verse 1, he says, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go and speak to the house of Israel. I opened my mouth. He fed me the scroll. He said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with the scroll I'm giving to you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. Then he said to me, Son of man, go now. Come to the house of Israel, and you shall speak my words to them. You're not being sent to a people of unintelligible lips or a difficult tongue. They, they don't have a hard time understanding in terms of intellect. But you are being sent to the house of Israel. Not to many peoples of unintelligible lips or difficult tongues whose words you can't understand. But I've sent you to them who should listen to you. Yet the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you since they are not willing to listen to me. Surely the whole house of Israel is stubborn with a strong forehead and a stiff heart. Behold, I have made your face as strong as their faces and your forehead as strong as their foreheads. Like diamond stronger than flint, I've made your forehead. Do not be afraid of them or be dismayed before them, though they are a rebellious house. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, take into your heart all my words which I will speak to you and listen with your ears. Now go, come to the exiles, to the sons of your people. You will speak to them and say to them, whether they listen or whether they refuse, thus says the Lord Yahweh. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard a great rumbling sound behind me. And you remember in, in John's vision, there was the great rumbling of the seven thunders, and it was closed up and secret, and we didn't get to know what it said. Ezekiel had a similar experience, and we do get to know what the rumbling said. Blessed be the glory of Yahweh in his place. And consider that rumbling from heaven all about the glory of Yahweh behind the prophet who must now go speak difficult words to a rebellious people. That's a helpful motivation. Verse 13, I heard the sound of the wings of the living creatures touching one another, the sound of the wheels beside them, and a great rumbling sound. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went, and here's our word, embittered. I went away embittered. Here, Ezekiel took the scroll into his mouth. It was sweet to taste the words of God. And the contents of it turned his stomach, made him bitter. But the hand of Yahweh was strong on me, he says, verse 14. So I came to the exiles who lived beside the river Chebar and Tel Abib, and I sat there seven days where they were living, causing consternation among them. It happened at the end of seven days, the word of Yahweh came to me saying, Son of man, I've given you as a watchman to the house of Israel, so you will hear a word from my mouth and you shall warn them from me. And when I say to the wicked, you will surely die, and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked way that he may live, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of your hand. High stakes for Ezekiel. A motivation about the glory of God and then the threatening of accountability if you do not speak my words. It's helpful to know they already don't like Yahweh's words. Ezekiel would be a mouthpiece. He would be faithful. There's tough news here. Look down at verse 23. So I got up and went out to the plain. Behold, the glory of Yahweh was standing there like the glory which I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell by my face, fell on my face. Again, another motivation. Strengthening the trembling knees of a prophet, delivering bad news, good news. Verse 27. When I speak to you, I will open your mouth, and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, He who hears, let him hear. And he who refuses, let him refuse. 
where they are a rebellious house. Chapters 5 through 14 of Ezekiel are a call to the nation of Israel to repent, a declaration that hard hearts would refuse the good news of mercy and restoration from God. And the sweetness in Revelation 10 for John is easy to see. He's imprisoned on a rock in the middle of the sea for his fidelity to Christ. He's old, isolated, persecuted by the enemies of God. The contents of the scroll indicate that Jesus will win, that the enemies will be defeated, that Satan will be vanquished and imprisoned and eventually cast into the lake of fire, that Christ will be vindicated, that God will be believed, the earth will be renewed, believers will be overcomers. That's great news for John. Sweet news. But what is the bitterness? The bitterness here for John is also what unfolds in the coming pages of the book of Revelation. And it is the same bitterness that Ezekiel felt. It is the recognition that the pathway to the kingdom is the great tribulation. The answer to the prayers, thy kingdom come, will run right through the troubling of Jacob, the purging of the promised people, where two-thirds of the nation of that generation will be cut off before there is national repentance. In fact, the nation of Israel in that day will be in such a sorry state spiritually that they will actually make a covenant with the Antichrist in order to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem and restart empty religious ceremony, perhaps motivated by national pride and identity, but without faith, without repentance, without trusting in Messiah. It will be as empty a temple as it was in the era of the New Testament. In fact, when you get to Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, in fact, look there, turn, turn the page over to the right. A reference to the two witnesses, Lord willing, we'll look at next week. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Okay, there's one city, and it has a nickname, spiritually, um, what is its nickname? Sodom and Egypt. Okay? One city that got burned up by fire, one nation that got judged for enslaving God's people. But both of these nicknames apply to one city. Open up your maps. What city is it? The text tells us right here. Where also their Lord was crucified. What city is he talking about? He's talking about Jerusalem. And what nickname, what pet name does God give to Jerusalem in the coming days that are in this little scroll that Ezekiel is about to prophesy to the world, or that John's about to prophesy to the world? Sodom. Egypt. The bottom line is world peace will come through Armageddon. And that turns the prophet's stomach Listen, it's sweet to know that Jesus will win and Jesus' victory will come on the corpses of those who rebel. That does not sit easy. It shouldn't. Finally, in verse 11, John is directed to proclaim the truth. He is to internalize it. He is to be affected by it. And then he is to turn and speak it. Verse 11, And they said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. They said, who are, who are the they? This is some unnamed heavenly entourage. Uh, it's in the plural. Uh, not important, I guess, for us to know who it is. And the command is, you must prophesy again. It's, it's imperative that this message not be secret. It must be published it must be broadcast. It applies to everyone. The angel holding this little scroll has his foot on the land and the sea. This is a universal message for a global audience. And the command is, you must prophesy. You must tell the truth about the future of many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That's a familiar refrain in the book of Revelation. We, we weren't expecting the word kings, however. We were expecting tribes. 
Tribes, tongues, peoples, nations. That's said a number of times in the book of Revelation in various orders. But here, tribes is out, kings is in. Now, what's happening here? Well, what unfolds next in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, 17, 19, are the detailed descriptions of kings on the earth. Rebelling against God, an assembly of the world's rulers under the Antichrist, they form an alliance with the beast. And listen, this is a reminder, if the prophet is to prophesy again about many kings, it is a reminder to us even in our day that God's word sits in judgment of kings. The word of God is over the world's rulers. It sits over the power brokers, the the financiers and influencers, the king makers, the jet set and the fat cats will all answer to God. That's a help little Christian, <laughs> to not be intimidated, to think about the glory of, the God, of glory of God and the rumblings of heaven behind us and the need of humanity in front of us, and who cares what kings say? We must speak God's word. That's the message to John. To internalize this word, to be affected by this word, and to proclaim this word. And John's experience in this is like the experiences of others who carry the burden of proclaiming God's word. And it is a burden. We saw that in Ezekiel already. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Uh, Not only the book of Jeremiah named for him, but the book of Lamentations. Sorrows, declarations of sorrow, weeping. Of course, he wrote Lamentations on a hill outside of Jerusalem, looking in on the siege of Jerusalem in his own day, the starvation and the devastation and the continued hard-hearted rebellion of God's people in the midst of absolute destitution and death. And he wept for them. Listen to Jeremiah 8, beginning in verse 22. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people gone up? Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place that I might leave my people and go from them. For all of them are adulterers, a solemn assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like the bow, and lies and unfaithfulness prevail in the land. They go onward from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares Yahweh. Let everyone beware of his neighbor. Don't trust any brother, because every brother surely supplants. Every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor and doesn't speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Your habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, declares Yahweh. What a sad state of affairs. It closes in verse 9 with this, Shall I not punish them for these things, declares Yahweh? On a nation such as this, shall I not avenge myself? Jeremiah could say, good riddance but he doesn't. He preaches God's word to them. Moses could have said, good riddance with his complaining people. Instead, he interceded for them. Jeremiah 6, verse 10, gives us another window into this prophet's heart. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised. They cannot give heed. The word of Yahweh has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Jeremiah says, but I am full of the wrath of Yahweh. I am weary of holding it in. Pour it out on the infants in the street and the gathering of the choice men together. Both husband and wife shall be captured, the aged with the one full of days. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and their wives together. I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares Yahweh. From the least of them to the greatest, everyone is greedy for gain. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone practices lying. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace. But there is no peace. 
Were they ashamed because of the abomination they've done? They were not ashamed at all. They did not even know how to feel dishonor. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall at the time that I punish them. Punish them. They shall be cast down. When Jesus was on the earth, he encountered a man, a Jew, who was rich, young, and a ruler, blessed by every standard that you could measure in that day, assumed to be blessed of God, to have all these things going for him. And when he refused Jesus, because he had many riches, it it would have been sad for him to give things up to follow Christ. In that scene, he rejects the giver of all good gifts so they could hold on to gifts he couldn't really keep. And what is Jesus' response in that moment? Heavy-hearted? Sad? The text tells us because Jesus felt a love for him. Think about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. Ben, this morning in our communion meditation, gave for us the song that was rehearsed at his triumphal entry. Save! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus walked in, and and as he approached the city of Jerusalem, he wept. And he cried out, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem. And there is a lament in Jesus' heart over the spiritual apostasy of the people he came to save. The same heart is in the heart of the Apostle Paul. Listen to Romans 9, verse 1. I'm telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit. Three different ways to say, believe me. I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Messiah according to the flesh. Why so sad, Paul? Why unceasing grief? Because his heart ached for his countrymen. Well, he's the proclaimer of good news to the Jew first, then the Gentile. Yes, but he also knows that the Jews remaining in unbelief will face the judgment of God for it. This breaks his heart to the point of saying, and the the grammar is interesting in Romans 9, I could almost wish if it were possible, maybe almost think that I could be separated from Christ for them. Can't quite bring yourself to say that most crazy exchange. And you feel the depths of his compassion and love for his countrymen who are enslaved to their unbelief. Romans chapter 10, same heart. Paul goes on to say, Brothers, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For not knowing about the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Here they are, a group of people rejecting good news. It breaks Paul's heart. Romans 11, verse 15. Here's some good news, bad news. If their rejection, that is Israel's rejection of Messiah and the gospel, if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? And there Paul is tipping his hat to the the remnant and then the future restoration of the nation through faith in the gospel. It's coming. But all of that is bound up in Paul's heartbrokenness over their condition. Look down at verse 20. They were broken off for their unbelief. If God did not spare the natural branches, verse 21, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and severity of God 
to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness. Look at verse 23. They also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. God is able to graft them in. And then in verse 26, the culmination, there's a day coming when all Israel will be saved, according to verse 25, after the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. It's great news. And it comes with the hard news of knowing that Israel will go through tribulation to get there. I think this is why Paul says at the end of Galatians, a book dealing with Jew and Gentile relationships and the question of whether Gentiles have to fall, follow Jewish Old Testament law. He closes the letter by saying this, mercy be on God's Israel. What do they need? What does his heart feel? They need God to be merciful to them through the gospel. This is the common thread through all of this, whether it's the Apostle John or Ezekiel or Jesus or Paul is that Israel was a people of promise. But they were simultaneously hard-hearted rejectors of their own message, of their own Messiah, of their own blessing, rejectors of their own hope. You're familiar with Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Christ came, that prophetic song about everything Jesus would do in his presence on earth, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension, intercession, glorious return, and all the fruits of his labors. It's all there in predictive form 700 years before Christ came. But it is predictive on two levels. It predicts the first coming of Christ 700 years prior, but it also looks forward to another time in the future. The the content of the servant song details the work of Messiah fulfilled in his first coming. But Isaiah 53 is future on another level still. It speaks to a yet future day when Israel will look back. They will look back in lament and in self-loathing, according to Ezekiel 20 verse 33. And they will look back in repentance, according to Zechariah 12.10, when the Holy Spirit pours out a spirit of supplication and grace. And they will believe the good news and grieve. The first verse of Isaiah 53 is this rhetorical question. Who has believed our report? In other words, all the details about what Jesus the Messiah would do in Isaiah 53, nobody listened. The nation rejected And since then, some 2,000 years have gone by, and generation after generation of Jews have rejected their own Messiah. This is heartbreaking. You follow the pronouns in Isaiah 53, and, and we often personalize those verses about ourselves. The transgressions of us fell upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. But the, the us and the we and the our there properly are Israel. We who believe in Christ now, Jew or Gentile, we benefit from the cross work of Christ and, and there's a way we can understand those pronouns. But, but Isaiah meant that the nation of Israel would look back on Messiah whom they crucified and repent and believe one day. And that repentance and belief comes with the sadness of generations of those who died in unbelief. Again, the, the word of God is clear Internalized, it is sweet to the taste and, and it comes with the stomach-churning bitterness of the understanding that God's victory means defeat for God's enemies and, and our hearts are attached to those who don't yet know the gospel. There have been centuries of them, millennia even of them. All Christians relate at some level to these experiences We delight in reading God's word, we internalize it, and we rejoice with the outcomes. We rejoice, we get to have a personal relationship to God. We have peace, an unburdened conscience, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and ultimate victory. We have been graciously conscripted to the winning side. 
The inexorable outcome is that Jesus wins and Jesus reigns and God is vindicated and all who believe in Him will forever live in unending and ever-increasing joy. This is sweet news. But our message is double-edged. Our good news is a free gift of life to all who believe. The corollary to that, the necessary corollary to that is unbelief does not result in eternal life. For those who reject a free gift, who choose to go their own way instead of walking God's path, death and judgment follow. This is a heavy double-edged sword to read, to internalize, and then to proclaim, to wield. Ours is not a message of good vibes only. Life is good. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Carry on. Think positive thoughts. No negativity. One author pointed out the, the phrase in our culture, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's not the Christian message. Those are the thoughts of a rebellious world that seek to push the truth to the sidelines. Ours is a message of life and hope and great news, yes, and it is the truth of coming judgment for all who do not believe. Truth is not always easy to swallow. Truth is not always easy to say. You may have a sibling, not yet in belief, not yet surrendered to Christ, not yet walking God's path. A child, perhaps, maybe a parent, a spouse, a friend that you care about, a classmate, teammate. You must take a deep breath and pray and speak. Take in God's word. You must be affected by it and you must speak it. We grieve at the death and the judgment of unbelievers. That's not a matter of rejoicing for us here. We follow God's heart in this, who is not willing that any should perish. He says in Ezekiel 33, 11, As I live, declares the Lord Yahweh, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? We take God's heart when we weep and we pray for our enemies. When we weep and pray and plead with those who are antagonistic to the gospel, who are rejectors of truth. It is compassion that drives our burden of sorrow. That compassion coupled with the glory of God rumbling in our ears ought to drive our evangelism. There's something wrong with our evangelism when it becomes a sport to play, a debate to win, or a merit badge to wear. If we have internalized the truth of the good news, then we must become the broken-hearted evangelists. Compassionate, prayerful, hopeful, joyful, sincere, humble, serious witnesses. That's what the good news ought to produce. Bible readers and Bible believers are happy people. I don't mean a shallow happiness, but a deep and abiding joy that cannot be touched by circumstances. It doesn't matter what you take from me, I have an unassailable new identity, hid with Christ in God that will be revealed when He returns. You can't take that away. No circumstance can touch it. I have untouchable promises from God who never lies. I have unstealable, unrustable treasures to which nothing on earth can compare. And I have an unchanging, conquering Savior who loved me and gave Himself up for me. He will transform the body of this corruption into a glorious body fit for the new heavens and new earth. He'll do that by the power he has to subject every enemy under his feet. And so Bible readers, Bible believers are profoundly happy people. But the happiness that we know 
does not sit solo in our hearts. It is married together with another sentiment. Bible readers, Bible believers are also serious people, sobered people, broken-hearted people. We carry the weighty burden of knowledge. We know the truth. We know the real problem of humanity. We know what happens in eternity. We know the solution. The knowledge of the gospel that lifts all burdens. The knowledge of coming judgment that motivates our proclamation. You think about Jesus' followers. John chapter 6, Jesus had fed the multitudes. Then he challenged their adherence to him. Of course, he was really popular when he gave everybody a free lunch. <laughs> then he explained to them the demands of following him, and people walked. Not after him, but away from him. And Jesus asked the disciples, after they said, what you said, Lord, is difficult. That truth was hard to hear. He said, do you want to go away too? And do you remember their, Lord, help me response? <laughs> Little faith. Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's pray. Lord, this, your word, is tough, double-edged, alive, true. It is delightful to us. What a gift that you would give us your mind and your heart permanentized in book form that we could know what you think, that we could know how you feel, and most importantly, that we could know you. God, your words are not always easy on the stomach. Our, our knees tremble. Our faith is weak and small. And our stomachs turn when we think about those whom we love who don't yet know you. We don't ask to be relieved of these tensions. We only ask that you would make us faithful. That we would walk out of these doors today and walk into our homes and our neighborhoods and everywhere we go with the serious joy that comes with the good news, bad news of the good news. Your words are wonderful. Amen.